的刀烤鸡非常非常好吃。In this video, you're going to see a ton of stuff, stuff that reminds you of the 1960s and 1970s. A lot of Toysan people cooking Cantonese food for other, you know, non-Asian New Yorkers, all the way to something like this, which is like straight out of Chengdu, 2023. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Fung Bros Food. As you guys may or may not know, New York City is home to the largest Chinese population density outside of Asia. So, I mean, that means that there's gonna be a lot of different concepts here, stuff for international students, stuff for older folks, stuff for non-Asian people. So today we are doing a crawl of spots that have all opened up in the past year to show you basically how New York City is thinking about Chinese food. We're gonna be covering so many different types of Chinese spots in this video, but this one is a chain directly from China. It's called Ye Men Chuan Chuan. Chuan Chuan is uh, these small skewers that they're gonna cook in hot oil, almost like in a hot pot style. It actually comes from Chengdu, uh, Sichuan, which is a province in China known for all the spicy stuff right now. These are 80 cents a pop, but they got stuff like a lobster tail. This is $10. We'll go, go ahead and put this back. Get the quail eggs, what, 80 cents? Oh, fresh beef, say less. Okay, so now that I've chosen my little Chuan Chuans, right? Each of these is 80 cents, but I have to pay $15 for the uh, spicy Sichuan oil, so it can add up, but today, you know, I think it's gonna be worth it. Uh, so, of course, guys, you can get Xiao La, Zhong La, Da La. I got Zhong. You know this is authentic, Andrew, because they have the Yo Die. Yo Die is something very unique, more to the Sichuan region, Chengdu, Chongqing. This is this specific mix. Die is for the Diezi, which is the dish. And uh, we can sauce this up a little bit even more if we want with some coriander. Of course, we got the green onion, but this is pretty much ready to go. However, we can also mix it from zero, or we can do uh, you know, a base level with some crushed peanuts and sesame and different things in there. Let's go ahead, get the oyster sauce. Boom! Sweeten it up a little bit. Black bean, get some oh, of that umami. Just like Great. Foodie, just like Foodie 88 on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like Foodie 88 on Instagram. We're gonna take some of this. Oh, green pepper sauce. Ooh. Trending recipe in China. Ooh! Trending ice cream bar recipe in China. Ooh! Get the green pepper from the Mississippi River. What up, friends and family? We are super excited to announce that actually our Smala chili oil sauce is out for pre-orders. You can click on that Shopify link right down below, but I'm excited. It's unlike anything else out on the market. And I know a lot of people say that, but even the form factor is different. We want you to take this everywhere and squeeze it on things, you know what I'm saying? And there's actually, it's very easy to clean up. There's no drip from the jar, but anyways, it's, uh, we like to say from Sichuan to Sicily because it is inspired by the Calabrian chili oil from Italy, from Calabria, and also fused with Mala chili oil. So it's kind of like a mixture of East and West fusion. Comes in a two pack, so you can give one to a friend, but trust me, it's worth it. Real truffle, real Sichuan peppercorn, real kick, real flavor. If you guys wanna see more pictures and see all the other things that I put it on, check out Smala Sauce on Instagram. Thank you so much for being with us on this journey. You know, it's been exciting and this is our first real product and we wanna just sell you a product that you and your family can enjoy. So check it out, Smala. All right, you guys, the Chuan Chuan has arrived. It's already done. I mean, you got free sauces, but you don't even need the sauce, but I'm going with the sauce. Yo, guys, I'm telling you, this is tasty, and I can see the labor of my work, of, you know, not that I really did any work, but simply picking it out, man. I got my sweet potato here, I got beef, I got beef, I got more beef, I got the konjac noodle, I got a, this is a coriander wrapped in beef. Let's go in the yo die. For me, as a very ABC person who barely speaks Chinese, but keeps up with Chinese things, it's very, very interesting to see a spot that you would imagine is at, at most in Flushing, Queens, versus being in Chelsea, you know, Midtown Manhattan, pretty much. Um, I mean, they have all these references to kind of like all these Chinese artists, like Ye Min Jun. Um, that's like the Dongbei artist that is famous for making these figures with the big mouths. 
and there's actually very little English. In fact, there's no English on this menu at all whatsoever. So I think it's really interesting. Guys, these Tron Tron definitely remind me of the ones that we had over in Chengdu with the Higher Brothers a long time ago, years back. And it's funny because when you pick it out, it almost like looks like this bouquet of saucy, spicy meat. for the con jack jelly mm, mm. guys I'm not gonna lie this is not like a low-fat food though mm. and I think the reason why Sichuan food is getting so popular nowadays is because almost the demeanor and the culture of the people is a little bit something that like Americans can really get down with I mean Sichuan people are known to kind of chill be more laid-back you know, further from the central government. So things like that, guys. And honestly, it's so funny because we're in Midtown and a lot of uh, non-Asian workers on their break were looking for a spot to get orange chicken. So they pop their head in here and they ask, hey, do you guys got General So's or sushi? <coughs> but maybe they'll be asking for Tron Tron soon. Hey guys, I can just tell you this, that this pot is so hot, this is probably the pot that they actually cook the Chuar in, so. It's spicy though. Be careful. On to the next spot. All right, you guys, we're at Cauldron Chicken here in uh, Greenwich Village. I'm here with Jason from Hunan. Jason, can you tell us about Daokoji? Daokoji shows some to us. Okay. Daoko Cauldron Chicken already have the three, over 300 year history so in China. So they cooking different than others. So they fry first and wait and they put it in cauldron and then boil and then spray and almost four hours. Hey man, yes. you heard it from him. Five spices, they're gonna boil it for four or five hours. It's a specialty from Hunan. This is even difficult to find in Beijing and Shanghai. Let's check out how to make it. As you can see guys, these chickens have already been boiled down with the spices, the five spice pack for five hours. I'm telling you guys, this is my very first time having Dao Kao Ji. I'm excited, man. Shout out to Hunan. All right, you guys, the Dao Ko Ji has arrived. Dao Ko is the famous city that this came from 300 years ago. There's a lot of stories involving like Qing emperors and dynasties and stuff like that. And uh, they said that you gotta shake this off. Normally when the whole chicken comes, you gotta just shake the meat off the bones. We're gonna go ahead and dip it in some of this uh, powder right here, some of the sauce. This is my very first time having Dao Ko Ji. Good? Yeah. I know what they mean because it's supposed to taste fatty without tasting greasy. And that's a difficult like thing to describe, but you can feel it when you eat this. Of course, on the side, we got the scallion pancake, the tung yo bing. I'm gonna take some of this da ko ji right here. Like we said, it is stewed in some precious medicinal soups. And I think that that is the key here of the da ko ji. I heard this was actually one of China's first famous chicken dishes in history. That's it. 300 years, scallion pancakes. Oh man, I had to take my sweater off for this one. All right, so immediately this actually reminds me of a Shandong dish called De Zhou Ji, which we actually had on a train when we were going from Shanghai to Beijing before. And it actually looks very, very similar, but he said it's different because the braise is better. He said the soup is better. So, so I, I gotta try it myself though. Oh my gosh, that chicken just came off super soft. Mmm. And one of my favorite things, my absolute favorite things about eating chicken like this, where it's all fried and braised and slow cooked, is that everything is edible. You can eat every part of this chicken. Even the little wing tips are tender. Mmm. And then all these little pieces that usually maybe on fried chicken or baked chicken are a little bit hard still. All the tendons really soft and you can just dig your finger into it. Now I gotta be careful, I don't wanna eat a lot of bone, but I'm just saying I can eat around the bone. That's how good it is. I can tell this recipe had 300 years to develop because it is delicious. I mean, man, if they were eating this good back then, I know why the Qing Dynasty wanted to stick around. Guys, let's to be honest, Greenwich Village is the last place I would think to find a deep cut Chinese dish, but you know what? Hey, it's here in New York. And look at this, I'm just shaking the chicken off. That's how you know it's really good. You can just shake, literally just shake it off. All right, on to our next spot. 
All right, everybody, our next spot is my favorite Chinese restaurant, one of my favorite Chinese restaurants in all of New York City, and it's actually vegan, Spicy Moon. It's a new location over on Bowery, guys. They are doing vegan Chinese food like you've never seen. I mean, shout out to the old school Buddha Bodai's in Chinatown, but this one is doing Sichuan vegan food. This right here is the dry pepper style pot. Super flavorful um, with no meat, guys. This is just tofu and vegetables. Here we have a hen of the woods mushroom bao, freshly steamed fried mushrooms. These are delicious. And then here you have your General So's mushrooms right here. Let me just break this open. Ooh, with nice General So sauce on top. And then you have chopped cheese, impossible meat, egg rolls, bro. And then of course your brown rice. But man, I'm just so excited to show you guys about Spicy Moon because I think this is the best Chinese vegan restaurant in America. I know for sure in New York, but I'm gonna say for the rest of America too. Yo, I think the history of this spot is really cool because the husband and wife actually met working at a Sichuan restaurant in New York, and then they opened up this one. And uh, actually the wife is from Sichuan and the husband, I'm not actually sure where he's from, but he's Asian too. Mmm, again, one of my favorite restaurants in all of New York City. And it's vegan, I never thought I'd say that. It is not short of flavor, not short of black bean paste, not short of chilies. Guys, it all used to be about vegan orange chicken, but now it's about vegan gan guo and vegan baos. We have our mushroom general so's. I asked for extra sauce. A little lemon squeeze on top. Let's get it. Mmm. These were two different types of mushrooms, by the way. There's more white mushrooms. Last but not least, guys. And this, to me, shows me that Spicy Moon is always innovating. They're actually opening a bar next door. This is a chopped cheese vegan egg roll. You guys know the, ve the, the, the egg rolls from, like, uh, Cheesecake Factory. Everybody loves them, you know? That was fire, yo! You know what's funny? When I see chopped cheese egg rolls, or if I get, if I see like a cheeseburger egg roll on a menu, I usually do not go for it. Be here, I'm so glad I got it, man. This is actually maybe one of the. This is probably the best non-traditional egg roll I've had in like five years. Wow. I mean, if you think about it, veganism is the wave, and also Sichuan food is the wave. So this restaurant is putting two and two together. Shout out to Spasa Moon. I don't even care that there's no meat in this. spot is Shanghai Villa out on West 4th. Uh, we're over in Greenwich kind of area and this spot originally was a vegan Chinese spot but they kind of changed the concept and they added a lot of traditional Shanghainese dishes but also some very famous Chinese American dishes. I want to show you guys. <laughs> All right David. So everything here looks pretty traditionally Shanghainese as you've seen from our other videos but except for this dish right here. These are the creamy peanut saute chicken skewers, Mr. Chow style. And you're probably wondering why do they have Mr. Chow dishes here at Shanghai Villa? Well, that's because actually the chef comes from Mr. Chow's originally and they wanted to provide something, you know, for the more Mr. Chow's, Mr. Chow's crowd, American crowd here. But anyways, let's go through the dishes. Here we have the classic chong yo mian, which is scallion uh, oil noodle um, tossed around. There's different variations of this, but this is only like six bucks here. Here we have the Shanghai Huan Tan with ji tai. And uh, let me just break that open for you. I love this dish, man. And it's like, I can tell the soup is super savory and sweet. Okay, there we go, you little meat inside. Here we have the regular Shaolong Bao, juicy. Oh, the, the, the soup is not coming out. That's a good sign. And then you have the classic Shanghai Xiao Mai. Uh, obviously different than the, the Southern Cantonese Xiao Mai. Uh, this is all mostly rice. And then you have the Shenzhen Bao, which is also another famous one, which is essentially a super thick soup dumpling that's fried on the bottom. 
First thing I gotta try is the peanut skewers. This is famous, like my uh, Dominican friend Marco, he loves this. He always talks about Mr. Chow's, Philippe Chow's. You know, this skewer is very iconic. It's red, it's creamy, and it's very sweet. Mmm. Wow. I've only had the Mr. Chow's version once, but it tastes just like it. Maybe this, the skewer pieces are a little bit smaller. This is three for $10, this is like half the price though. Mmm, that sauce, it's tender, a little bit of spicy kick, I like it. This is your scallion oil noodle and sometimes they put, uh, some people will put like shrimp in it and make it a tanzai man. But anyways, let me try it because this is a very, very traditional Shanghai dish. Mmm, slippery, chewy, al dente, nice smooth umami scallion oil. Salty, but not too salty. All right, moving on. You guys gotta try the Shanghai one ton. And what I love here is that they're mixing kind of like very Americanized dishes with uh, very authentic Shanghai dishes. So probably, I don't know if the Mr. Chow's crowd is gonna be ordering this dish. Mmm. Mmm. That's good. That's good. I. I don't know, that's up there for the dishes. I gotta try the other ones, but oh man. All right, here, I have the Shenzhen Bao. I'm gonna try it with some of the vinegar here. I know this isn't the best way to eat it. I'm just gonna eat it with my hand. But since there's probably hot juice in here, I gotta be careful. Is it improper to eat Shenzhen Bao with my fingers? You let me know. All right, as far as the Shaolong Bao goes, or as I would try to say it in the Shanghai dialect, Sholo Bo. I tried, I tried, I tried, judge it, guys. Uh, but yeah, let me dip it here. This is the pork one. Here I have the vegan ones here. I'm gonna try this because this originally was a vegan restaurant, but they just recently added a lot of meat dishes. So of course, you know, it has both. Mmm, nice and light. Ooh. I like those a lot, not too fatty, really clean broth. Let me try the vegan ones. All right, and like, um, I'm gonna try to speak some more Shanghainese again. How we'd say, uh, have you eaten is non Oh, this one's still meat, actually. Oh, that's good. Okay, I'm gonna guess that this is the vegetarian one. There we go. That's the veggie one. Let's try it, guys. Veggie shallon bao. I think this is the first vegetable shallon bao I've ever had. Can you make a vegetable juicy? Yes, you can. That was actually really good, man. If I was vegan, I would totally eat that. Let me bust this open for you. Just so you guys can see what's inside. I know the juice is gonna come out. Oh, that's the meat, the little imitation meat right there. All right, guys, to end it off, I have the Shanghai Shao Mai right here. You can get this off the streets in Shanghai. I remember the first trip I went to in Shanghai, uh, this would be eaten a lot in the morning because it's got a lot of carbs. Not as much meat, obviously, as the Cantonese one, but, you know, still good. Mmm. I mean, guys, in my hand, I have a very traditional Shanghai dish, and then I have a very kind of new school Chinese American dish. Um, and I just think it's really cool that they can be served together here at Shanghai Villa over in the West Village, um, you know, and, and on our channel, we'll always try to like say the phrase of the dialect that we're, we're eating. You know, I know like Shanghainese, you know, it's very hard to find someone who could speak it. So I definitely can't speak it, but let me just say, I don't know how to speak Shanghainese. Wu Fu Gong Zha Hei Wu. All right, you guys judge it down below, but on to our next spot. All right, you guys, next up, just like Dao Ko Chicken, we've got a China concept that is a direct port over. We've got Jibei Chuan. 
This chain actually has 400 chains in China, and it was started by this Cantonese man named G, Mr. G, and uh, he traveled all over, and he sort of came up with his own ideas, mixing Cantonese food with Yunnan food and Sichuan food. And this is what they ended up with. All right, you guys, let's take a look at the Mishan rice noodles that made Mr. G a very rich man. You know, we're talking about fish maw. This is the swim bladder from a larger fish like a sturgeon or some type of fish like that. Um, of course, that's the Cantonese side. You've got the Mishan, which is more of the Yunnan influences, but you're also looking at some Ko Shui Ji right here, which is from Sichuan. Uh, apparently, you know, just me reading the board, Mr. G was a very well-traveled man to the different provinces and regions of China. Let's get into it, guys. I'm super excited to get this. this this is 1995. Okay, yeah, that's good. You got fish in there, you got chicken in there. You know, this fish maw can get really expensive when you get it dried pound by pound. I'm telling you guys, this fish maw tastes almost like the fish equivalent of a foie gras from a duck. Uh, it's hard to describe. It's kind of like cheesy in texture almost. Livery, in, but in a good way, because it's fish. How do I compare this to actually like purely authentic Yunnan guo chow mian, which is the crossing bridge noodles? I would say this definitely has more Cantonese tong influences. Of course, you got some nice chicken thigh right here. Listen, if you're an older Cantonese person above the age of like 40, you're gonna prefer this version to the Yunnan version because it's half Cantonese flavor. All right, everybody, I got the tomato soup flavored beef brisket one, and I can tell that this is Cantonese influence because look at this aulam. It's kind of like the curly, shrivelly ones. I'm not gonna lie, this really reminds me of a Cantonese dish, even the cuts of aulam, AKA beef tendon, where it's in a way, I'm not gonna lie, like the ugly cuts, but honestly, it's something that I often encounter at Cantonese restaurants, so I'm excited. Mmm. David, you're gonna love this tomato soup one. A little bit citrusy, very umami. Dude, you got me excited, bro. Um, I'm gonna get dig into this Ko Shui Ji right here. Ko Shui Ji basically means mouth-watering chicken. This is from Sichuan. This is probably one of the major dishes, Andrew, from Sichuan that I started, I've started to see served all around mm. China. And uh, yeah, Andrew, uh, you, you see it a lot more now. It's like people are breaking out of that like provincial lo local mindset. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Mr. G is a Cantonese guy, but he's starting a very popular Yunnan rice noodle chain, okay, but that would be kind of similar to maybe someone from Seattle getting popular, like starting a popular southern fried chicken chain, or, or, well, there is some truth to it, because, you know, uh, the Colonel uh, spent some time in Seattle, but actually, it's almost like the guy from Seattle starting Taco Time, a Tex-Mex chain that's very popular, so it's like outside of the province, man, like. I mean, I think nowadays, if you look at America, you have chains like BJ's, Cheesecake Factory, they serve something from New Orleans, they serve something from New York, they serve something from Florida, a Cubano. Everything's mixed up nowadays. You don't only have to stick to your one city and your province. Beef and tomato. Hey man, I'm just saying this, Andrew. This Coach Way G has a really unique flavor to it. And like I'm telling you, man, like you said, this Cantonese man, Mr. G, he was just thinking different. He was genre mashing like Kanye. What I like is like, you know, if it's like a cold, chilly day out in New York City, you get this big cauldron of rice noodles and you're just like standing over it and it just warms you up. It's almost like what pho does, you know what I yeah. mean? And I love pho, I love, love pho. But I gotta say, this, I'm gonna work this into my winter rotation for sure. Listen, it's 2023 guys, get me Xian in your winter rotation. Next up on brand new Chinese concepts. This is not brand new. Actually, this is a redux of something from 1964. One ton noodle garden that made it all the way from around the corner. They just have had, a, uh, had to have a rebirth here. But like we said, you are looking at recipes from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. And I'm telling you, there are so many different types of people right now. Just post up and there's a lot of people here that were in their prime years in, in 1964. What we're looking at are a few things that I've never had before. This is 
rolled churn fun with uh, peanut sauce and hoisin on it. Literally, guys, you can see on the inside. It's a deep fried version of something that was rolled up. As you can see, this is not a rice cake akin to the Korean tteokbokki. This is literally a rolled up churn fun. Um, honestly, if they added some jelly to this, it would just be a PB and J. It might even go more viral amongst the side talk NYC crowd. Like we said, guys, you have some of your NYC Sino classics from the 1960s. If you've only eaten authentic Chinese food your whole life, you don't even know what you're looking at right now. This is a one-ton wrapper folded once with some meat inside. You dip it in here. Very similar menu to Wohop. Wohop, I believe, was from the 1950s or 60s as well. Just the tiniest bit of meat, but you know what? Gets the job done. As you can see, guys, this is, for some demographics of people, or maybe a lot of demographics of people, still their favorite type of Chinese food. New York style, 1960s, 70s, 80s recipes, like these gigantic one tons. Um, they like dry food. I noticed, you know, not as much of the soups, that's more for the Chinese people, but a lot of low means. Mm. Like I said, guys, I still enjoy a lot of these recipes from 1982. However, of course, my palate extends way beyond that too. And uh, I'm not really blaming anybody for freezing their taste buds here, but definitely I kind of am like, man, it would be nice to like advance beyond the 1980s years. But I guess if you like big hair, you know, band rock, you like big hair band rock, you like Kiss. Honestly, this reminds me of the food that you would find at an elevated Chinese buffet, and a lot of those menus were developed in the 90s, but it does not mean that this food tastes bad at all. In fact, I even enjoy it as well. You know what I could use though? There's some small out. You know, like I said, I don't blame especially older people who are in their prime years in the 60s, 70s, and 80s for coming here, but for the younger people, I would like to push their taste buds to the next plateau. Oh man, I gotta admit, this is some of the better chow mein I've had, and this, this is a very kind of Chinatown style, but it's actually really delicious, man. This food totally reminds me of all the food that the detectives, even in maybe CSI, you know, Law and Order might be eating when they're at the Anyways, guys, uh, this dish is actually really interesting. One thing that I started doing is peeling these off and then dipping them in to the sweet one-ton sauce. So it's kind of like the peanut butter and jelly uh, dish that we were talking about earlier. Mm. By the way, all this food, $40, that's not bad, man. I think it's really interesting because this actual venue, this actual restaurant space, turned over three different concepts. One, it was a modern Korean cafe that was serving fried chicken and beer. And then two, it turned into a Thai chicken and rice spot. And then three, it turned into Mei Lai Wap. And actually, they kind of like tuned it backwards in a way where they kind of made it look a little bit older than it was. And that's actually what connects with people, which is interesting enough, you know? And I think that does kind of speak to what people want in Chinatown. It's like eating off these paper plates, it doesn't bother them. Eating kind of like these dishes from 1980, it doesn't bother them. Because at the end of the day, it is high quality and good. So, hey, this is maybe what New York wants. All right, you guys, our next Chinese concept is Lotus and Cleaver. It's basically like dig in, but with Chinese food elevated. It's difficult to explain. You just guys got to see. Uh, can I do the uh, noodles for my base, please? So, hey guys, it's just like your typical bowl spot in whatever city you're in and near the office zone. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pick uh, two market sides, right? What do you recommend? Let's do that. Let's do the mushrooms. Eggplants. Cool. Probably do the, um, the eggplants. If you guys know eggplants are really popular in China because meat traditionally was very expensive, that uh, led to the popularity of eggplants because it kind of has a protein-like vibe to it. Um, can I do the uh, heritage pork chow siu? And definitely get a, can I get a lot of uh, green ginger scallion sauce on it? No problem. Now, I know a lot of people are like, oh, why are you putting uh, ginger scallion on the chow siu? That's more for chicken, right? But that's just how I like it, gurm chung everything.
So right now we're in a food hall called Jackson Co. It's right across the street from the iconic Jackson Park building, which is I think is like 70% Chinese students. And we're in Long Island City right now. Um, everybody always wanted to know what a Chinese dig-in looked like. I know a couple people who tried over the years, but uh, I might have to say Lotus and Cleaver, they did certainly one of the highest end jobs. You have the cha shio right here, yam noodle underneath, braised eggplant, braised mushrooms. So it's very good. I would say the noodles taste more Pan-Asian. The cha shiu tastes Chinese. The eggplant tastes Chinese, but toned down a little bit. And here's the braised mushrooms. It tastes very Southern Chinese in the sense it's a soy braise, ginger, soy sauce. And um, yeah, like we said, guys, if you guys ever wanted to see, you know, your market style, almost like Whole Foods version, but Chinese at a reasonable price, come to Lotus and Cleaver. All right, everybody, I am on 14th Street, and I gotta say this, man, it is starting to become very, very Asian. I mean, everything from Q Ramen to now Little Ulu to Party, and then a Panda Express just opened. Okay, obviously, you know, I still consider that Asian. I would almost consider 14th Street to become a little bit of a new Boba Avenue, should I say, Poor T Street, because there's a lot of tea shops here. And right outside, that was a putt. Uh, I got Little Ulu, which is a pop-up right now. They have a window, and this is the sunny side of matcha latte. They have uh, sweet cream and then a little bit of mango jelly on top to make it look like a over easy egg. So it's crazy out here, man. This was $9.25, I'm not gonna lie. It is not cheap, but it is decadent and delicious and very cool, very Instagrammable. Let's check it out. Guys, I love Ulu as a restaurant. I love their spot in East Village. Now they're doing a brunch spot here. And honestly, the quality is crazy. That's delicious, man. You guys are gonna go come hang out on 14th Street. Not to only mention that, they also have a food hall that also has some really good chicken rice straight from Singapore. Gen so. BBQ. And also a Gen BBQ. So really, I don't know, 14th Street is definitely changing, especially on the south end of the street. I don't know about the north end, but the south end is definitely turning very Asian. So, guys, 14th Street, check it out. Our next new Chinese concept in Manhattan is Shorty Tang's, AKA Tangy Noodle. This is actually the owner of Hua Yuan, which is a really nice Peking duck restaurant in Chinatown, but he's actually famous for his noodles. Um, his family went from Sichuan to Taiwan to NYC, so it's really a hybrid of a lot of things. As you can see, they have the Kuan Mian here, which is the wide noodle uh, for the beef noodle soup, but you also have a gigantic beef spare rib in there, almost like people are doing like for modern day pho. We gotta taste the broth, AKA the tongue. Ooh. Yeah, that's spicy. It's good. As you can see, we got the wide noodle here. This moved here from the upper east side, I believe. All right, you guys, let's take a look at this big uh, meal pie, which is this big beef rib. Like we said, this is all the rage right now. If you've had a $25 bowl of fur recently, this is what it is. All right, you guys, this is $25, but honestly, this is one of the better bowls of New Roman beef noodle soup in the city. It's pretty cool. You can actually taste what came from Sichuan, what came from Taiwan, and the big beef rib. This concept, this is definitely New York City. Moving on, last but not least, Andrew, they've got the sepsime noodle. This is uh, the same dish that made Hua Yuan famous amongst all the politicians and everything like this. So we're gonna mix it up right here. This is a zima mian. It's vegan. There is no meat in it. Let's check it out. Listen, guys, they've got an ultra modern noodle machine in the back. They're serving some Southeast Asian inspired prawn noodles, a little bit more like the Hokkien Mi from like Singapore. So, hey, man, shout out to Shorty Tang.